Hey guys, it's KJ from The Scariest Movie Ever, and I recently made a really interesting discovery. I wanted to share it with you in this video. I've always been fascinated with mysteries, mind control in our modern media, occult symbolism in our world, and what it really means. Mysteries of the cosmos, mysteries of God, and not only exposing the so-called Illuminati symbols in our popular culture, but exploring the meaning behind these symbols. After all of these years of researching all these strange subjects, sometimes it's hard not to feel like you've seen it all. And then, just when you think you've seen it all, something like this comes along. So long story short, I stumbled onto this forum that wound up really blowing my mind. Had a lot of amazing information in there. And the whole thing, as I was reading it, it resonated with me. It was posted from a woman that clearly has worked in the Hollywood industry. So I originally found it on a website called Indian in the Machine. And it was titled Close Encounters with Celebrities in Show Business. Clones, Satanists, Prostitutes, and Serpents Dying for Attention Literally. How could I not want to read this article? It really was a fascinating article, and it wasn't really so much an article as it was a blog. She was just making entries, and I traced it back as far as I could. I only found it in two other places. On Indy and the Machine, it was posted back June 2nd, 2012. Now, I found it going all the way back to August of 2010, and it was posted by a person calling themselves Felicia G. And since then, it was posted in two other places, and that's it. Now, the reason I thought that was so interesting is because of all the information in these blog entries. Now, take it from me. I have seen my share of these kinds of messages, these kinds of posts, these blogs. I know a lot of you have seen this stuff, too. I mean, any one of us that are interested in these kinds of things, the so-called conspiracy theories or the Illuminati or... UFOs or the paranormal, whatever it is. I mean, most of us who've really done our digging for a few years, we've seen most things, right? Most of us have seen most of this stuff. But every now and then, something comes along that's just special. Something comes along that you've not heard before. And I promise you, this is one of those times. This is why I thought it was very interesting. It's been around for five years now, and hardly anybody's really heard about this. And I really think the best way for me to do it is just to read it and let her kind of explain it in her own words. Now, I'm not covering everything. She goes off into a lot of different tangents. Sometimes it's stuff just about the business or about her life out there. Sometimes it gets into clones. Now, if I was to do something on clones, that would take a whole other video. So maybe I'll touch on that another time. But what I'll do is I'll go ahead and leave a link underneath this video so you can go and check out the post for yourself and read the whole thing. I just kind of pulled out some of the juicier tidbits, a lot of the Hollywood Insider type info, a lot of stuff about the Satanism going on out there, and a lot of other things as well. So sit back, relax, and uh, check this out. I think you're going to see that once I start reading this and once you start hearing this lady's experience, you're going to be able to connect a lot of this to a lot of the information you've seen throughout the years. It's, it's very interesting stuff. If anything, this is going to fill in a lot of gaps that have been there for a very long time because most of us are well aware of that satanic Hollywood system. But this lady's talking about things that happened in Hollywood all the way back 20 years ago and since then. She's covering a lot of territory here, so it's very interesting stuff. But another reason it really rang true to me personally is, and I've mentioned this in other videos and I think on some of the radio shows as well, but I worked out in Hollywood myself for many years. Now, I was a writer and I had an agent and all that, and I was always trying to sell stuff. But for work, I was working in television, mainly in reality TV, and I worked in production, so I wasn't any kind of a big shot or anything. But I'll tell you this right now, if you want to hear the best Hollywood stories, the real Hollywood gossip, the stuff you're not going to see on like E! Entertainment TV or Bravo or any of those daytime talk shows, the best way is to know somebody that works in the industry in production or to get out there and do it yourself. Because oftentimes these people have been out there for years and they've worked on movies and TV shows and They've even been to a lot of the parties. Sometimes they've even dated some of these stars. So when you're working out there and you're with this peer group of people who are all trying to make it in the industry, you find the best stories, the juiciest stories, the wildest, craziest stuff. And to me, that's exactly what this video is going to be. This is a lady who put up a blog five years ago, decided to spill the beans on some things, 
no one really caught on to it, it seems like, but I don't think that mattered to her. She was just trying to put stuff out there. So without further ado, kick back, relax, and get ready for something very special, and most importantly, I think, mind-opening, enlightening. This stuff shines the light on a very, very dark industry. August 2010, Felicia G. I'd like this thread to be a place where anyone who has had first-hand experience interacting with celebrities can talk about what they've observed. This includes anything anomalous, which might speak to the idea of replacements, clones, synthetics, or even spiritual possession. Even if all you did was see someone perform live at a concert, or you attended a book signing or political rally, or maybe you had a random moment where you walked past a famous person, I'd love for you to post observations here. Also, I would love for people who have worked on stage professionally, or as a model, or in film, or TV, or music video sets, to share any observations they might have had about weird things that make you go, hmm, the entertainment world is full of high strangeness. My own history comes as both a former actress, singer, and also a writer. Also, I'm just someone who has come across a lot of celebrities and people who work in show business as part of my daily life. Some of it comes from the area where I live, which is an artistic area where lots of celebs and artistic people chose to vacation or even retire. I think I only understood the idea of replacements being possible on an intuitive level for a really long time. Most of what I observed has to do with significant emotional, spiritual, and interpersonal changes that happen when people are presented with really big show business opportunities. Please understand something very important as you read this thread. At any given time, the members of the Screen Actors Guild are 99% unemployed, and there are many, many other actors who are non-union who are also working in the industry on and off, and they are also about 99% unemployed. For the years I worked as an actress, I was equity eligible, which at the time was a subcategory of stage performers who had worked on jobs earning equity minimum rates, but had never actually been hired in an equity show. At the peak of my acting career, I was making equity minimum rates, which in the late 80s, early 90s was $300 per week, and that was considered rich living in the acting industry, believe it or not. Most acting jobs last from four weeks to three months if you're doing a stage show, such as with a regional theater, dinner theater, or youth theater. That's part of the reason why the unemployment rates are so high. Jobs don't last very long because shows might have a run for just a few weeks, and then you have several weeks of rehearsals before that, so your entire work period might consist of a very short period of time. I did many different kinds of work, ranging from regional theater to Shakespeare in the Park type stuff to summer stock, kids theater, school tours, things like that. In between, I worked as much as possible doing things like voiceover work, live events like industrial work at auto shows as a spokesmodel, and TV and film bit parts. I was lucky to work steadily during the time I was a professional actress. I never took work as a waitress, for instance, to keep me going between I jobs. I seemed to always have a gig going on. Most of my friends, in the meantime, made more as waiters and hostesses in restaurants and worked for two-thirds of the year in the restaurant industry. And many of them were a lot more talented than I was. Show business is just a brutal, brutal industry. In the stage world, which centers in New York, you have the gay mafia running things. Be friend of this crowd and you will continually get work. Piss them off and you'll never work in this town again. I had written a play once that a former Broadway producer was looking at. She was a lesbian woman who had worked on several big-name Broadway musicals in the 1980s and 1990s. At one point, she pissed off some of the gay males who run the industry in New York, and she literally became homeless almost overnight from the blacklisting. She liked my play, but told me she couldn't really help me any further because all of her friends had turned on her. So to be clear, it is a gay male mafia that runs the theatrical world in New York. This makes for a very weird dynamic when you seek stage work in New York, as I did. Many gay males took to me because at the time I was pretty glamorous and looked like Jennifer Connelly or maybe Brooke Shields, a very popular look at that time. It got me a lot of work. When the rare straight male stage director auditioned me, it was always a casting couch situation. Sleep with me or you don't get work. And I always refused. So the only work I really got in the theater from my New York auditions was from gay male directors. Now on the flip side of things, if you were a gay man auditioning for work and a gay male director was casting, you also needed to be ready to sleep with the director. 
One of my friends was very willing and got a supporting role in a Broadway musical, but the show bombed, unfortunately. He didn't really care about sleeping with the director, he just thought it'd be kind of fun. Now I'm explaining the background here of the stage world. The stage is very different from TV and film, which I'll discuss here in a moment. Most of my steady work came from auditioning in New York for theaters that were out of town, so I traveled and did tons of work up and down the East Coast. A lot of the jobs were very fun, again, because I worked for either gay male directors who admired me or straight female directors who simply cast me for my talent. Now, I mostly did comedies and kids shows and period pieces like Shakespeare, with a few musicals thrown in. Stage work can be very beautiful because you get to project loving and positive energy to a crowd and attempt to share something uplifting or educational with the masses. All of the actors I knew were very sweet and we all tended to be the typical right-brained creative types who were very idealistic and kind of naive about the world. And often very, very oversexed. Any cast I was in always became an orgy of almost everybody sleeping with everybody else. Where it got weird was when the power players, the producers, directors, would adopt a cast member as a lover. Then that person was usually elevated to a position of power. They suddenly took over the lead, for instance, with the original person suddenly not showing up for work, and no one knows why. I was fortunate to come from a loving family, but many of the performers and models I knew did not. When they came from abusive homes or single-parent homes, they almost always became more vulnerable to prostitution, abuse, and drug addiction in the industry. Some of it is driven by the very real harsh economics of working in that industry. Again, 99% unemployment, let alone trying to compete with a gazillion people who are prettier, more talented, and who have bigger boobs and skinnier bodies than you do. So from a director or producer's perspective, when you have thousands of gorgeous young men and women dying to get a part, why not have some hidden job requirements like sleeping with the director? If one woman refuses to do it, chances are there are hundreds behind her in line who will say yes, and that's the mentality. The problem is that young women often think that sleeping with the director means that they will be taken more seriously as a performer and get more access to media roles. It doesn't always work that way. I knew two actresses, one who was a comedian actress and the other one who was just an actress, and they were trying to make it in New York and were pursuing every option possible, knocking down doors, pounding pavements, all that. One of them ended up sleeping with this yucky comedian named Jackie Mason because he told her he would help her get live comedy gigs in the city. He did invite her to perform at one event, but that was it. She stopped sleeping with him pretty quickly, and the entire experience really darkened her, you know, blackened her spirit. She went from this gorgeous Italian-American New Jersey comedian to this saddened, heavy-drinking, harsh-toned woman almost overnight. She told me he gave her drugs, too, so God only knows what really happened. The other girl, the actress who was friends with the comedian, actually had a TV agent in the city who put her up for a minor speaking role on the TV series ER. This actress was told that she needed to sleep with, I think it was a casting director, not the episode director, and either way she did it, and she did get a small performing role. Her agent had basically operated as a madam setting her up to sleep with the director to get the role. After the agent knew the actress was willing to go that route to get the work, she set her up to work as a full-time escort between acting jobs. The last I talked to this poor actress, she had descended into full-time prostitution because she wasn't getting auditions for acting work anymore. But her agent was sending her loads of Johns to sleep with at the same time. So many acting agencies are fronts for prostitution, escort services, S&M Dungeon Master stuff, and even worse. Joe Franklin, who had a late-night TV talk show in New York, was another one famous for getting young girls to sleep with him while making all these promises about how he'd set him up in show business. And, of course, it never happened for any of the women. It was always a setup. So when a lot of these men of power see all these gorgeous, talented, and often very sexual women pursuing jobs in New York, well, these guys take advantage. Now, I'm still talking about stuff happening on a relatively human level, man to woman. It's abusive, it's nasty, sure, but in some ways, it's a story as old as time. What I've talked about so far is what happens in the very lowest levels, the lowest tier of show business. 
this is where I was, where people were basically just working for a living, trying to keep themselves and their integrity intact, naive about the larger stuff going on for the most part. Some made bad choices, fell into prostitution, drug use, and even porn. Amongst the models, actors, and actresses I knew, this happened to a lot of them. And most of the people I personally knew well actually would stay at that level. They never really became famous or big. I did, however, have many first-hand brushes with celebs who were on a much higher tier, and weird stuff was constantly within these circles. Most open modeling casting calls are really prostitution fronts anyway, or they just force you to spend lots of money on unnecessary headshots, professional photography, and then the agency makes more from pimping and from the photos than actually getting the model's work. At those open calls, they want really pretty and really dumb, submissive women. Very sad how such women are taken advantage of. As I mentioned in another thread, I do believe that there are two realities within the industry. The insider bloodline types, who literally make a phone call after they get out of Juilliard or film school, and they immediately get work in the industry. Or they've come from some multi-generational abuse type families. And then there are the nobodies like me, who get work but don't have those connections. In my career, whenever I would cross slightly over into the reality of potentially getting bigger roles in TV or film, I was always presented with the pay-to-play prostitution demand, which I always refused. I kept thinking each time I hit that wall in various cities and various shows and film projects that surely, at some point, I would find a big role that didn't require that. But I never did. Casting directors, agents, and or directors always made it very clear that you not only make yourself available to sleep with that specific power player, but most actresses are expected to be on call in what's basically a pool of prostitute escorts for other powerful people that particular person might know. Models also end up in this situation, only it starts very young for them. Since a model's career is usually over by 25, they start working at 13 to 16 years old and begin working as prostitutes from day one in addition to going on modeling calls. Because models also have to keep an extremely inhumanly thin physique, they are fed cocaine the very first time they're at a modeling shoot, usually, and this keeps them lively and bouncy for the photo shoot, lowers their sexual inhibitions, and makes them feel part of the adult crowd. I have lived on a property where many Ralph Lauren and other high-profile clothes catalog shoots have been held, in addition to many women's magazines shooting photo spreads there. Cocaine was handed out at the refreshment table much of the time. I usually showed up, grabbed a snack, and left. I couldn't believe how open the drug use was. The models were sickly thin but looked great in those bulky clothes. So to cross into the higher echelons of entertainment, if you don't have family connections, you work yourself through the drug use, the sexual permissiveness, the prostitution, there's escort levels, and this in turn leads to things like mind control, having handlers, and into darker levels of what I believe is spiritual possession or even soul loss at a very profound level. At some point, if you wake up from the almost constant mind control and trance induction and you say no, you can either be told you will never have a career, as happened to me before I got involved with this crap, and or you could have your physical well-being threatened. I myself had some death threats from one assistant director who had chosen me to play a recurring character on a TV show. I did about ten episodes. He was always inappropriately flirtatious with me in a really creepy way, and when I showed up one day with an engagement ring on my finger after getting engaged, he got really nasty. He threatened my boyfriend's life and mine. I couldn't figure out why. I was just a bit player. Nobody famous. Nothing, really. He threatened my boyfriend's life and mine. I couldn't figure out why. I was just a bit player. Nobody famous. Nothing. I just laughed it off at the time, but I knew another girl who had gone the prostitution route on that very same show, and she actually slept with the same assistant director, which got her exactly six speaking lines in one episode, and she became creeped out by him really quickly. She talked about how he was violent with her during sex, always feeding her copious amounts of drugs, and talked about how the next time she'd come over, he'd make sure and bring over some of his friends from the set so they could all have some time with her.
She refused and broke up with him after that, naively thinking that this was a relationship of equals. She moved back in with her ex-boyfriend, and that boyfriend had the tires shot out of his truck. She was also gang-stalked while out driving for months, and her agent would no longer return her phone calls for so-called unprofessional behavior. Now, of course, this unprofessional behavior was her breaking up with the assistant director. But again, though, I'm just talking about lower-level shenanigans in the industry right now, and I'll talk more about observing actual celebs next. I just wanted to provide more background on the thuggery, the mandatory prostitution, and the drug use that is constant in the TV and film world. And I really didn't see this in the stage world at all, so it seems more tied to the modeling, TV, music video, and film worlds. What I've described so far is really the grooming stage, which I believe later can set the stage for a performer, once they get famous, to become deeply embedded in a very dark world indeed. And having seen how dark it is, I can't help but see that there must be people who protest and wake up at some point. And I also see how their waking up must be a real threat to the controllers of this system. So of course they are threatened, silenced, and even killed. And that's the way the game works out there. It's awful. One TV show I did starred Carol O'Connor, and the show was haunted by problems. Parasitic drug dealers literally took up residence in the tiny Georgia town where we filmed, preying on the cast and the crew. Actor Howard Rollins had a major cocaine problem throughout the filming, and even Carol O'Connor's own son, Hugh. He had been given a small role on the show, so Carol could keep an eye on him. He was prone to drug problems but he became a sitting duck for the drug pushers and sunk deeper into his drug addiction during the filming of the series. Some years later, he died of an overdose, and the women on the show were so horribly skinny and coke addicted it was terrible. They keep the women of TV and film horrifically thin. I could see the ribs and backbones of the main actress, Anne Marie Johnson, and a guest star who was a woman from soap operas when they filmed a party scene wearing backless gowns. They seriously looked like refugees from a concentration camp just like models. And neither of these women was large in any respect. They needed to each put on another 20 pounds just to be healthy. Many of the episode directors complained about how Anne Marie was getting too fat. Yeah, the residents of Dashu were so frickin' fat. What lard asses they were. What twisted people these were. Carol O'Connor was always polite yet distant with everyone. Once in a while you'd see his famous humor come through in some improvising, some shades of Archie Bunker actually coming through. The show was very serious and dramatic and slow-paced. It was called In the Heat of the Night. I was struck by how Carol O'Connor seemed smaller and frailer than he did as Archie Bunker, but I wrote it off as age. Plus, he had a heart condition, and the stress of having to film extra hours due to his co-star's drug problems added to that. At one point during production, he had a heart attack. Now, about a completely different celebrity, I want to tell you about a time that I was kicked off an alternative news conspiracy site some years ago for sharing the story that I'm about to share with you now. We all know Michael Jackson hadn't been Michael Jackson for a long time and was possibly replaced several times. And he came from a horrifically abusive family where his dad sold all of his children into bondage, basically. Many stories about how old Joe Jackson once kicked little Michael in the crotch so hard that it may have actually led to permanent damage to his testes. Other people used to speculate if that was the reason for his really high voice. Anyway, lots of mess going on there. The Being, who was masquerading as Michael Jackson around 1990-95, often rented out a suite at Leona Helmsley's The Palace Luxury Hotel. A friend of mine in the hotel industry took me to see this huge penthouse suite, which takes up two whole stories, and had an amazing view. Beautiful grand piano, endless rooms. Now this woman who was the concierge there during the time Michael Jackson was staying there told me about how he would have groups of 10 to 15 Mexican boys, under the age of 15 typically, shipped in by a mysterious limo driver who would show up at the back delivery entrance and bring the kids in for play dates. Now, Michael also always had Bubbles the chimp with him back in those days. The boys would stay over for a night or two and then be shipped back out again. My friend and all the staff used to dealing with VIPs knew that they would be blacklisted from working in the hotel industry in New York if they ever let word out about this. 
The rooms were always a mess afterwards, she told me. Semen stains all over the expensive couches. She showed me some of the specific couches that had to be replaced several times. Really, really nasty stuff. And she didn't want to tell me anything more, but suffice it to say that the insiders in the VIP hotel lodgings world see a lot of the stuff involved with child sex trafficking and sex slavery. And these people being shipped in for all these certain stars... The same goes for women's sex slaves, too. It all depends on the celebrity's tastes. Another hotel industry friend who worked in lots of L.A. hotels on the West Coast talked about Tom Cruise, and she said that he keeps, to this day, a very special luxury penthouse apartment for parties with his male gay friends and gay male escorts, some of them underaged. So there is a ton of this underground sex slave prostitution trafficking stuff that sits right alongside the drug industry both with parasitic hands on the world of stars, celebs, and models. Are these the originals? Were the originals this goofed up? I don't know. The replacements do seem heavily indulged, though, if that's what they are. They get all the drugs and sex they want, plus loads of spending money, fame, attention. Cinematographers are also heavily into the dark stuff that is so pervasive in the film and TV industries. Through friends of a friend, I've had several conversations with a man who has been a main cinematographer on tons of mainstream hit films. He worked on Kill Bill with Uma Thurman and Quentin Tarantino and David Carradine. He described working on that set and his whole gleeful description of the constant immersion in blood. Fake blood, of course, one would hope. He also gleefully talked about body parts being tossed into scenes and other celebrations of carnage, and it really made me sick. And he just loved it, because he's a nasty piece of work. He described this weird affair between Uma and Quentin Tarantino and how he would sort of program her to do her scenes. The real Uma seems very different, quiet, low-key, nerdish, and even bookish, so definitely lots of programming and handling was going on there. Now, I've never been able to watch the movie. Tarantino's work is just such an openly satanic celebration of bloodlust. I really want to kill the bastard. This cinematographer has also worked with some major action directors like Michael Bay, who I'm convinced is not from here. He's just not human. I mean, go look at his eyes in the photos sometime. He's a weirdo. But again, this cinematographer only seems to work on these action, bloodlust, and bloodletting type movies. This guy, the cinematographer, was also a major creep who kept his wife at home. Then he'd go off someplace like China for six months and sleep with a second-tier actress and crew members who all worked on the set. And then he'd come home to this clueless wife. Now, this happens all the time out there. And horrific all around, really. Sets pretty much operate as free-falling orgy zones. Married people suddenly become unmarried for purposes of filming, and then they go back to their significant others later. Michael Douglas did this for years to his long-suffering wife, Deandra. Kathleen Turner recently confirmed this in her biography. The same thing played out in the earlier marriages of both Mel Gibson and Kevin Costner. Remember how for ages their publicists promoted them as these ultimate family men, still married to their longtime sweethearts, devoted dads, all that stuff? Well, now the truth is coming out about how abusive Mel is, and Costner is always getting caught sleeping around. It's such a creepy world. Don't believe any of this knight in shining armor spin about any star, male or female. And yeah, it's all right there in the pageant industry as well. I was in the Miss Teen Pennsylvania pageant back in the day. I think that is what it was called back then. And during the three-day rehearsal period before the pageant, I was pretty much told by the production heads that I was being given a very favorable rating by the important people because I could sing, dance, I had good grades, etc. It was weird. It was like they were telling me in advance I was going to win. Not that the prize was much. I think it was just a couple of thousand dollars. Anyway, as we headed into the dress rehearsal stage and were finalizing our performances for the show, one girl who was very sexually precocious and who had a really large rack on her started noticing how the judges and pageant directors were paying me a lot of attention. So she started kissing up to them. Well, she ended up actually winning the pageant. And I kept in touch with my roommates, three girls I had roomed with over the rehearsal weekend who were all contestants just like me. And one of them later told me that the girl who won had slept with one of the male production people. Pure coincidence that she happened to win? Of course. I mean, the girl was 16 years old, but she did look 22. 
So I hope she was okay after that and didn't sink into that horrible little sideshow world of larger national pageants. I also knew a former Miss Pennsylvania, a very clean-cut athlete type of a woman. She was Miss PA in the late 80s sometime. She talked about how at the national pageant it was all about who would be most sexually accommodating to the judges that weekend, before the final pageant show was held. She didn't win Miss USA, but after what she saw, she had no regrets at all. And you know about the now D-list actress Tara Reid? She of all the addictions and the crazy plastic surgeries. She makes her living earning about $20,000 to $50,000, at least back when she looked better, as a private escort to many wealthy international men. Because when you are a C or a D level celebrity female, you actually earn more as a prostitute than as an actress. And I guess the attitude of these poor, abused, mind-controlled women is, hey, at least it's a job. They call it per gig, which usually involves travel to be with the gentleman in question somewhere out of the country, at his estate, a private island, or a yacht, the usual stuff. Now, Pamela Anderson has been doing the same thing for a long, long time. She makes more, though. There are many, many actresses involved in this, and there's also plenty of actors involved in it as well. Now, many others like this one actress, Mina Savari. You may have heard of her, but she had made a really big splash in this movie called American Beauty. But in recent years, she had totally disappeared off the map. She's actually making loads of money as a dominatrix, catering to clients with certain, well, tastes. Now, a lot of this information concerning the actors and actresses who are actually involved in prostitution is not only gleaned from my own personal experiences, but also from a lot of my friends who work in the higher-end hotels in L.A. and Las Vegas. Since SAG minimum rates for a day-long gig used to be, I don't know, what, $500 a day or something like that? I really have no idea what it is now. But minor stars might get 10000 for a small walk-on role as the villain in a TV series. But it turns out that they can actually make way more consistent income doing the call girl stuff and call boy stuff. Just whatever. In addition, many female celebrities got started in prostitution and later became stars. Or they worked in a few roles, their careers stalled, and then they went into prostitution, serviced the right client, and then their careers became bigger again. Case in point, Denise Richards, who was working as an escort when she got involved with Charlie Sheen. Her acting career never really took off, and she always had more work as a call girl than anything else. Paris Hilton was a notorious L.A. prostitute, and the only reason she ever became a celebrity was because she blackmailed certain highly placed entertainment people who were in her little black book. And that's how that horrible woman was foisted upon us all, and young girls especially, who for a while really looked up to her. But her arrest for cocaine the other night is more typical of what she's always been up to. Paris now makes between 500000 to $1 million just to show up at a party for, like, the King of Bahrain's son and stuff like that. She does those international prostitution party appearance gigs all the time. There is also a big esoteric psychic ritual component going on in Hollywood. Depending on the wiring of the woman, she might be used to conceive a particular type of a soul during a ritual. She could be used as a breeder, and then suddenly the baby disappears. Also, there are sexual rituals, and they're usually used to bring energy to a person, a company, a project, an endeavor, or even to a location. Older women are often used to help a younger member, male usually, of a connected family celebrate his sexual maturity. You can think of it like a bar or a bat mitzvah ceremony, only instead of coming of age spiritually, he is celebrating coming of age sexually. This can be done when the child is between the ages of 12 or 15 for boys, and not too long after a girl's first period for the younger girls. You have the Madonnas out there who groom these younger women to eventually take their place with these sexual psychic rituals. But sometimes the older ones are still being used for other things, too. It's never really been about youth, but more about the energy and being able to access that person to harvest that psychic energy, that emotional energy. And the women who have had a lot of sexual abuse and fragmentation and damage in their past, they're especially popular in this regard because they can be trained not to remember being abused, and they'll tend to dismiss everything as a great party in which they had great drinks and drugs and had sex with multiple people, and then they went home with lots of money. Pamela Anderson wrote a novel, I'm sure with a ghostwriter, but she wrote it a while back that talked about one of her alter egos. 
and discussed these frequent orgies which she participated in. Thinly veiled real stuff. But I don't think that book talked about any of the deeper esoteric stuff going on. Again, with mind control and fragmentation, sometimes the person doesn't even recall everything they ended up being used for. I know a second tier TV actress. She's like C or D list movie actress. And she's done some story arcs on various crime and law type series. Often as the long suffering wife who turns out to be a killer. You know, that type of a thing. She usually films for two days, which is max after work. And since she has a little bit of a name, she can pull about 10,000 to 25,000 every time she gets a story arc like that. But still, she works rarely. Like most actresses her age, she's in her 50s now. If she had slightly more name recognition, she says she could probably make more for these types of gigs. But since she hasn't been in a mainstream movie for a while, her asking price keeps going down. She's someone who actually did not end up in the prostitution sex slave track. But then she took a long time off from the biz to get married. She had kids, you know, live a normal life away from L.A. and New York. And so she's a lot more of a character actress anyway than that type of a blonde, buxom, impressionable sex kitten type, which actually probably saved her life. With some of these ladies, it's helpful to look at the constellation of people they've dated. How did Anne Hathaway end up engaged to wealthy real estate developer Raffaello Falleri, for instance? Here's some info on some of those connections from June 2008. It says, More trouble for Raffaello, the fiancé of Devil Wears Prada star Anne Hathaway. Attorney General Andrew Cuomo is investigating the Falleri Foundation, a charity headed by the 29-year-old Italian businessman. The Post has it that Cuomo's office has subpoenaed financial documents belonging to the Manhattan-based foundation, which is involved with vaccinating children in developing countries, among other things. Valeri last made headlines when he was arrested for bouncing a $215,000 company check issued on behalf of his own real estate company. Now, those charges were dropped when he paid up last month, and earlier this year he also settled a lawsuit brought on by billionaire Ron Burkle. Hathaway's spokesman tells the Post that the actress no longer serves on the foundation's board, though she had traveled to Central America with Valeri last year for a charity-funded vaccination program. Cuomo's office declined to elaborate on the investigation, but apparently it has something to do with the Foundation's failure to file tax disclosure forms required of nonprofit groups. So with this fiancé, you have a bunch of things going on. First off, when someone who's in the industry like Anne Hathaway is suddenly engaged to a guy like that, it's almost always due to an arranged escort prostitution date. Now people think it's just because famous and wealthy people meet at parties, but it is not. Think of Cindy Crawford and Richard Gere and how they said they met at a party. No, she was a paid escort for the evening. At the higher echelons, these women, especially the supermodels, are expected to keep the powerful men company. It's all a part of the deal. Sometimes it works out nicely and the woman actually enjoys being with the guy. She ends up with a full-time gig, if you will, as the real girlfriend or wife. And that's how you often end up with actresses marrying these directors. Or it's more cold and calculated. Yeah, he gets a bit of expensive, famous, beautiful arm candy, and she thinks she's going to get lots of work because she's married to the director. But you see, it doesn't always work out that way. Many of these directors rarely use their wives in their actual films. Anyway, with Anne and Raffaello, you also have the constellation of Raffaello having done a business deal with the infamous Ron Burkle, who happens to be a billionaire friend of Bill Clinton, who is widely known to be a guy who loves procuring models and other willing women for Bill, as well as enjoying some on the side for himself. So these threads all interconnect. Also, you have the connection through Othello to some world charity vaccination program type stuff, with Anne having sat on the board of the charity and traveled to third world countries doing what they call, quote, good works. These organizations are usually fronts for prostitution, sex trafficking rings, and drugs, but they love to have someone wholesome like Anne as the face of the organization. Now, I'm not saying she knew about any of this stuff, she may have genuinely believed everything was on the up and up. Anne and Raffaello eventually broke up, but apparently she had let him take some naked photos and videos of her. And she was freaking out for quite a while, at least that's what the media was telling us. She was afraid that they were going to be released. Now that's exactly how the mainstream press always spins this stuff. She agreed to do some sort of porn photos and video for the guy, with the understanding that it would be only circulated amongst a connected group of his friends. But after she broke up with him, all bets were off. And she knew he might get nasty and circulate some of this stuff wider. 
So this press release makes it sound like these were just some innocent little photos and bids taken between a consenting couple. But that's not how it usually works. The actresses agree to do porn in exchange for all the perks of being with the rich guy, but with the understanding that they lose rights to that material if they break up with the guy. I think that Anne got lucky or perhaps made some other concessions or deals because the release of this material didn't completely spoil her industry image as the nice girl, but it looks like some of it is leaked to the net and is viewable online. There is a higher tier in the porn world of homemade stuff by gorgeous actresses and models whose boyfriends just happen to be directors, photographers, celebrities, or other connected people, and they get these exclusive access to these sex tapes or photos that these women do. I'm sure her fellow passed Anne's stuff off to his friends like Ron Burkle did. It doesn't mean that it was ever going to be in wider release at the lower levels of porn distribution. This is the more exclusive stuff, just for the exclusive circles. I'm afraid that these are the same exclusive circles who probably have access to these snuff films and sacrifices that are filmed, and that many of the same people who end up being replaced might also have their deaths or torture filmed and circulated. I can't say that with 100% first-hand knowledge, but I have known people who survived sex trafficking and that they say that snuff films are done when a sex slave, prostitute, call boy has gotten a bit too haggard or maybe worn out around the edges, past his or her sell-by date, and or have pissed off the wrong people. And there is a huge market in these exclusive connected and wealthy circles for that stuff. I think if we really want to know what happens to the people who get replaced, that such snuff films would unfortunately tell us more than we would ever want to know. About Melissa Joan Hart. She's been working in show business since the age of four, and having starred in Sabrina the Teenage Witch for all those years, she's no doubt highly skilled at moving esoteric energy, mind control, and even hypnotic energy, and influencing her young female fan base with whatever themes the producers, writers, wanted to get across. Now, a lot of that is probably unconscious on her part. She's just doing what she's been trained to do. Her husband, Mark Wilkerson, is a bit of a puzzle, though. Very little info available on him, even though he has his band called A Course of Nature, which has had some minor hits. The two of them did name their first kid Mason Walter Wilkerson, which is interesting. Who uses Mason as a first name, unless it has some significance? Perhaps a nod to the Freemasons, I was guessing? My sense of the couple is that they are very good workers for the system. They represent the good guy, good girl platform. They are being used by the system, but might not be insiders themselves. Melissa is busy being a good breeder, though. Just had her second kid, I think. Keep in mind with the breeder women is that there are often children born between the pregnancies we hear nothing about. They're the ones that get donated or sacrificed. Kids who can move psychic energy as powerfully as Melissa no doubt can and will be highly prized. I also wouldn't be surprised if Melissa's own children, or at least one of them, don't get offered to the star machine when they are a little older. As expected, since I joined this forum, I've been getting a certain amount of unpleasant pushback for posting. And that's why I've sort of been posting in a burst. I'm going to probably have to go dark for a little while after my flurry of posting, but I'm sure you'll all understand why. I'm not even in the industry anymore, but the psychic attacks and the synchronistic real-time warnings have been kicking up again. This always happens when I start talking about real things. Some of you probably know me from past posts on esoteric type forums and alternative journalism, conspiracy forums, where often an entire group of gang stalking behavior starts kicking up when I piss off the wrong person. So it's not a lot of fun. Speaking as a former performer, I always had a very pure and spiritual component, a very genuine intention to spread love, light, and positive emotion through my work as an actress, a singer, musician, comedian, writer. Very early on, I ran into the dark arts. There is literally a much more pervasive dark form of art that is ruled by the Illuminati, uh, reptilian, negative ETs, demons, whatever you want to call these things. They're all pretty much the same group from what I've seen. I did tons of Julie Andrews, upbeat, positive type work. Largely comedic, some of it kids theater, a lot of it musicals, most of it live stage work. It was only when I started auditioning for, say, David Mamet type plays, in which the women are always hardened and usually whores, that I started to see the bizarro universe that coexists in the arts next to the more innocent, love and light, you know, having fun, making friends, trying to change the world crowd.
whenever I auditioned for the darker roles, I was always creeped out by the metaphysical components. A lot of negative energy is always attached to these directors, the casting people, the actors, the actresses. A theater in which that stuff is happening feels completely different than, for example, a nice little dinner theater out in the country where I portrayed a character in Camelot. The dark stuff definitely involves negative entities. Often these entities and energies that the performers welcome into their bodies is a form of willful possession. Remember Oprah Winfrey's book Beloved, which she did a while back? In interviews she talked about allowing herself to be literally possessed by a dark, unhappy spirit of a slave so she could better play the role. This is what actors and actresses are encouraged to do, to become entirely disassociative and to allow something other to come in. About the Olsen twins from Full House, I don't have any first-hand knowledge of them. All I know is that the twins always creeped me the F out. Like they were possessed as very, very little girls, maybe? Then when the one Olsen twin just happened to own the apartment where Heath Ledger overdosed, and the massage therapist who found the body, hint, she wasn't a massage therapist but a hired sex worker, called the Olsen girl first instead of 911, that just seemed to be par for the course with them. Remember, the satanic blood sacrifice type feeling of Heath Ledger's death coming just as Batman was coming out? And how the whole morbid situation ended up creating huge box office receipts, not to mention a posthumous Oscar nomination for poor Heath? You think that was all manipulated in some way? Absolutely. It's all about looking at the connections that these people plug into. You'll find a lot of nasty and juicy stuff that way. As far as all the clones and synthetics, I'm not really sure exactly what is going on there myself. I do have a theory that sometimes horrific plastic surgery of the type that really is more mutilation than beauty improvement can sometimes be done as a form of torture to bring the star in line. I can't even look at some celebs like Mickey Rourke or Heidi Montag or even Ashley Simpson without thinking maybe the original is still in there, but were they tortured into shutting up or falling in line some way? So using extreme surgeries as a form of torture and abuse might happen long before someone is actually replaced, or maybe in place of the replacement. But then, some real plastic surgery does take place, of course, to make replacements look like the originals, too. So it all gets very confusing. Traditionally, a doppelganger is considered a double, either a physical being or a non-physical being, which mimics someone else in every way, to the point that people get confused as to who's the real one and who's the original. One of the most famous doppelganger stories was of Percy Bysshe Shelley, husband of Mary Shelley of Frankenstein fame. Not long before Shelley's death, his friends reported seeing him walking outside a window of the house, but it wasn't him because the real Shelley was somewhere else at the time. Since he died soon afterward, there were whispers that that had been a doppelganger, which can often be said to be a harbinger of the original's death as well. If you travel at all in this world and happen to work in a field in which you're exposed to lots of strangers, you soon see that there are only a certain amount of body, skin, voice, and personality types out there. In my work as an actress, I'd regularly move to a new town, end up living in close quarters with 30 complete strangers, and get to be very close to those new friends during the time we'd work together on a show. But what struck me after a few years of doing this is that I was starting to see doubles everywhere. Certain types kept repeating themselves. Amongst gay men, for instance, I kept seeing repetitions of almost the exact same type of man over and over again. Very eerie when you've traveled to a new part of the country, and the guy has a different name, but he sounds, looks, and acts exactly like someone you befriended months before in a different state, or even on a different acting job. When you haven't traveled very much, you don't see this kind of a thing, but trust me, it is very real. So, that does mean that the frequency of natural, physical voice and personality doubles is higher than you might think. Unless you've traveled a lot and spent time with tons of strangers as a gypsy performer type like I have. Then I went on to do counseling for a decade and worked with thousands upon thousands of strangers, and I saw doubles all the time. These weren't just people who looked alike and talked alike. Their issues and problems, the dynamics they were experiencing in relationships, family, work, all of it repeated itself to a T. Anyway, there seems to be the good Jedis and the dark Sith Lords in the arts. And unfortunately, the darker arts are being strongly celebrated these days.
Actresses like Anna Paquin, who didn't have much of a career after her childhood nomination for Best Supporting Actress in The Piano, has had to turn to the dark side of art to get recognition again in her vampire TV series True Blood. There can be a lifelong process of trying to get a talented artist to turn to the dark forces. And after that happens, a lot of subsidiary dark stuff starts happening. Involvement in arranged dates with powerful men or women in the industry. Feeding the stars tons of drugs just to get them to disassociate and go along with the abuse. And then involvement in actual dark rituals and sacrifices, but more commonly, sex rites. At least like in the beginning of Eyes Wide Shut. The negative gatekeepers need a certain amount of true artists, light worker types, who are more fueled by love and innocence. And sometimes such types are targeted to be moved to a higher level of the playing field, while at the same time keeping them surrounded by relatively nice handlers who don't really corrupt them, at least not yet. But it seems that everyone in the industry has to make the choice between corruption or getting out of the industry at some point. Drugs and alcohol and spiritual possession make it easier to say, screw it, I'll do anything to get a job. But a lot of people who try to make it okay within themselves end up the victims of replacement later on, because at some point they usually do protest or get what's called a big mouth and give that one revealing interview or comment to the media that can get them into real trouble. So in conclusion, I just wanted to say that I didn't cover everything from her blog. Again, I'm going to leave a link underneath so you can go back there and check it out. She goes more into detail about cloning and doppelgangers and things like that. Most importantly, if you're not familiar with this kind of a subject and this is your first time seeing this kind of a thing, please understand this is just uh, the tip of the iceberg in a lot of ways. A lot of this stuff is really going on. However, in all the years I've had of exploring this kind of stuff, this really is some explosive information. It's, it's fantastic information because it lines up with a lot of the stuff I've seen throughout the years myself. And I'm sure a lot of you can relate to that as well. Ultimately, I hope that this video opens up your mind. I hope it opens up your spiritual eyes. Essentially, we are under attack at all times through the media. And you have to be aware of that. You've got to know that this truly is a satanic system. Because these people running these industries, they're in it. They're all in. They fully believe. Not only do they believe in God and the devil, they've chosen a side. Well, anyway, folks, thank you very much for checking out the video. I'll talk to you later. stuff to summer stock kids theater school tours things like that in between i worked as much as possible doing things like voiceover work live events like industrial work at auto shows as a spokesmodel and tv and film bit parts i was lucky to work steadily during the time i was a professional actress i never took work as a waitress for instance to keep me going between i seem to always have a gig going on most of my friends, in the meantime, made more as waiters and hostesses in restaurants and worked for two-thirds of the year in the restaurant industry. And many of them were a lot more talented than I was. Show business is just a brutal, brutal industry. In the stage world, which centers in New York, you have the gay mafia running things. Be friend of this crowd and you will continually get work. Piss them off and you'll never work in this town again. I had written a play once that a former Broadway producer was looking at. She was a lesbian woman who had worked on several big-name Broadway musicals in the 1980s and 1990s. At one point, she pissed off some of the gay males who run the industry in New York, and she literally became homeless almost overnight from the blacklisting. She liked my play, but told me she couldn't really help me any further because all of her friends had turned on her. So to be clear, it is a gay male mafia that runs the theatrical world in New York. This makes for a very weird dynamic when you seek stage work in New York, as I did. Many gay males took to me because at the time I was pretty glamorous and looked like Jennifer Connelly or maybe Brooke Shields. A very popular look at that time. It got me a lot of work. When the rare straight male stage director auditioned me, it was always a casting couch situation. Sleep with me or you don't get work. And I always refused. So the only work I really got in the theater from my New York auditions was from gay male directors. Now on the flip side of things, if you were a gay man auditioning for work and a gay male director was casting, 
Now take it from me, I have seen my share of these kinds of messages, these kinds of posts, these blogs. I know a lot of you have seen this stuff too. I mean, any one of us that are interested in these kinds of things, the so-called conspiracy theories, or the Illuminati, or UFOs, or the paranormal, whatever it is. I mean, most of us who've really done our digging for a few years, we've seen most things, right? Most of us have seen most of this stuff. But every now and then, something comes along that's just special. Something comes along that you've not heard before. And I promise you, this is one of those times. This is why I thought it was very interesting. It's been around for five years now, and hardly anybody's really heard about this. And I really think the best way for me to do it is just to read it and let her kind of explain it in her own words. Now, I'm not covering everything. She goes off into a lot of different tangents. Sometimes it's stuff just about the business or about her life out there. Sometimes it gets into clones. Now, if I was to do something on clones, that would take a whole other video. So maybe I'll touch on that another time. But what I'll do is I'll go ahead and leave a link underneath this video so you can go and check out the post for yourself and read the whole thing. I just kind of pulled out some of the juicier tidbits, a lot of the Hollywood Insider type info, a lot of stuff about the Satanism going on out there, and a lot of other things as well. So sit back, relax, and uh, check this out. I think you're going to see that once I start reading this and once you start hearing this lady's experience, you're going to be able to connect a lot of this to a lot of the information you've seen throughout the years. It's, it's very interesting stuff. If anything, this is going to fill in a lot of gaps that have been there for a very long time because most of us are well aware of that satanic Hollywood system. But this lady's talking about things that happened in Hollywood all the way back 20 years ago and since then. She's covering a lot of territory here, so it's very interesting stuff. But another reason it really rang true to me personally is, and I've mentioned this in other videos and I think on some of the radio shows as well, but I worked out in Hollywood. Hey guys, it's KJ from The Scariest Movie Ever. And I recently made a really interesting discovery. I wanted to share it with you in this video. I've always been fascinated with mysteries. Mind control in our modern media occult symbolism in our world and what it really means mysteries of the cosmos mysteries of God and not only exposing the so-called Illuminati symbols in our popular culture but exploring the meaning behind these symbols after all of these years of researching all these strange subjects sometimes it's hard not to feel like you've seen it all and then just when you think you've seen it all something like this comes along. So long story short, I stumbled onto this forum that wound up really blowing my mind, had a lot of amazing information in there, and the whole thing as I was reading it, it resonated with me. It was posted from a woman that clearly has worked in the Hollywood industry, so I originally found it on a website called Indian in the Machine, and it was titled Close Encounters with Celebrities in Show Business. Clones, Satanists, prostitutes, and serpents dying for attention, literally. How could I not want to read this article? It really was a fascinating article, and it wasn't really so much an article as it was a blog. She was just making entries, and I traced it back as far as I could. I only found it in two other places. On Indy and the Machine, it was posted back June 2nd, 2012. Now, I found it going all the way back to August of 2010, and it was posted by a person calling themselves Felicia G. And since then it was posted in two other places, and that's it. Now the reason I thought that was so interesting is because of all the information in these blog entries, stage professionally, or as a model, or in film, or TV, or music video sets, to share any observations they might have had about weird things that make you go, hmm, the entertainment world is full of high strangeness. My own history comes as both a former actress, singer, and also a writer. Also, I'm just someone who has come across a lot of celebrities and people who work in show business as part of my daily life. Some of it comes from the area where I live, which is an artistic area where lots of celebs and artistic people chose to vacation or even retire. I think I only understood the idea of replacements being possible on an intuitive level for a really long time. Most of what I observed has to do with significant emotional, spiritual, and interpersonal changes that happen when people are presented with really big show business opportunities.
Please understand something very important as you read this thread. At any given time, the members of the Screen Actors Guild are 99% unemployed, and there are many, many other actors who are non-union who are also working in the industry on and off, and they are also about 99% unemployed. For the years I worked as an actress, I was equity eligible, which at the time was a subcategory of stage performers who had worked on jobs earning equity minimum rates but had never actually been hired in an equity show. At the peak of my acting career, I was making equity minimum rates, which in the late 80s, early 90s was $300 per week, and that was considered rich living in the acting industry, believe it or not. Most acting jobs last from four weeks to three months if you're doing a stage show, such as with a regional theater, dinner theater, or youth theater. That's part of the reason why the unemployment rates are so high. Jobs don't last very long because shows might have a run for just a few weeks. And then you have several weeks of rehearsals before that, so your entire work period might consist of a very short period of time. I did many different kinds of work, ranging from regional theater to Shakespeare in the Park type Hollywood myself for many years. Now I was a writer and I had an agent and all that, and I was always trying to sell stuff. But for work, I was working in television, mainly in reality TV, and I worked in production, so I wasn't any kind of a big shot or anything. But I'll tell you this right now, if you want to hear the best Hollywood stories, the real Hollywood gossip, the stuff you're not going to see on like E! Entertainment TV or Bravo or any of those daytime talk shows, the best way is to know somebody that works in the industry in production or to get out there and do it yourself. Because oftentimes these people have been out there for years and they've worked on movies and TV shows and... They've even been to a lot of the parties. Sometimes they've even dated some of these stars. So when you're working out there and you're with this peer group of people who are all trying to make it in the industry, you find the best stories, the juiciest stories, the wildest, craziest stuff. And to me, that's exactly what this video is going to be. This is a lady who put up a blog five years ago, decided to spill the beans on some things. No one really caught on to it, it seems like, but I don't think that mattered to her. She was just trying to put stuff out there. So without further ado, kick back, relax, and get ready for something very special, and most importantly, I think, mind-opening, enlightening. This stuff shines the light on a very, very dark industry. August 2010, Felicia G. I'd like this thread to be a place where anyone who has had first-hand experience interacting with celebrities can talk about what they've observed. This includes anything anomalous, which might speak to the idea of replacements, clones, synthetics, or even spiritual possession. Even if all you did was see someone perform live at a concert, or you attended a book signing or political rally, or maybe you had a random moment where you walked past a famous person, I'd love for you to post observations here. Also, I would love for people who have worked 